So good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, I'm Kenneth Polanski, Dean of the Biological Sciences Division in Pritzker School of Medicine. It's my pleasure to uh, be able to welcome you to this very special event. Um, we always, or I always say that uh, in the Biological Sciences Division, we have three missions, uh, scholarship, uh, education, and patient care. And today we are celebrating two of those, uh, patient care and education. And uh, we are celebrating what you will see is a very unique uh, program that I think will allow the University of Chicago to have a huge impact in both of these areas uh, across the country and across the world. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce President Zimmer, President of the University, uh, to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Kenneth. So it's, it is my great pleasure to announce today uh, the establishment at the University of Chicago of the Buxbaum Institute for Clinical Excellence. The innovative program that the Buxbaum Institute will pursue, which lies at the very heart of the quality of medical care and the values of the University of Chicago and its Pritzker School of Medicine, is made possible by the extraordinary generosity and vision of Kay and Matthew Buxbaum. It is their gift of $42 million that enables us to establish the Buxbaum Institute and undertake the ambitious program that it represents. Uh, we're all aware of the enormous advances that have been made in tests, pharmaceuticals, devices, invasive and non-invasive techniques, and protocols that have led to important advances in the practice of medicine. But at the heart of medical care, at its very foundation, lies the relationship of a physician and patient, where a great deal of the art and the science of medical care come together. And it is on this relationship that the Buxbaum Institute will focus. The program will entail both multidisciplinary research about this relationship and extensive training of cohorts of medical students, younger faculty, and senior faculty in an effort to elevate the capacity of our students and physicians in this fundamental aspect of clinical care. And we hope and expect that the leadership in developing the doctor-patient relationship as a way of improving outcomes of clinical care will enable the University of Chicago through the Buxbaum Institute to have an impact nationwide on the nature and quality of clinical care. Kay Buxbaum is here with us today. I want to thank her and through her thank Matt as well for her vision in wanting to make a major impact on the delivery of clinical care in the United States and her trust in the University of Chicago that our values and commitment made us a place where her aspirations could be realized. Please join me in expressing our thanks to Kay Buxbaum and welcoming her to make some remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think it would be nice if you sit down. <laughs> The reporters who quizzed me before writing up the news of the funding of the gift for the Buxbaum Institute for Clinical Excellence asked me what inspired such a gift. I told them that a few years ago I was musing on what I perceived as changes in the initial, call it altruistic, call it idealistic, motivations which I had often noticed in young people contemplating medical school. <clears throat> I saw a big difference in many by the time they were into their practices. We know the pressures on young doctors, not so young doctors, but we see a few <clears throat> who do not seem to have lost that fervor in helping people, for getting to know their patients well, for living a satisfying life in the service of others in a healthy medical practice. As I was musing, I thought, could there be ways 
in which medical education could point students in a direction that would result in good relationships with patients, as well as their own satisfactions in practicing the art of medicine. I brought the question to my doctor, Mark Siegler, <coughs> which provoked a train of thinking that has eventually led to this day, over three years shaping the goals into a working plan, then figuring out the administrative requirements, meeting with my family and the legal help necessary to honing it and to bringing it to reality. From the out, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> From the outset, my husband, having had exceptional medical care through Dr. Siegler and others at the university, enthusiastically applauded the germ of this idea. It was broached with our children, who became increasingly interested in what this institute could do. Our daughter, Anne Friedman, as it evolved, read its iterations with a fine-tooth comb. There were a number of what ifs that came to her sharp mind. She wanted us to be sure that the program would not overlook serving patients that have often been underserved. Questions she asked focused our thinking. When the agreement between us and the university for establishing the institute was beginning to see the light of day, our son John, who had had much negotiating experience, was especially helpful in finding ways to overcome sticking points. Our attorney, Marshall Eisenberg, was enthusiastic from the outset about helping us bring this idea to reality. Achievement of education to develop the mutual satisfactions of a good doctor and patient relationship were always at our forefront. Excellent models for the chosen Buxbaum scholars to observe and to learn from would be a key to this kind of education. Excellence in the understanding of many sorts of patients could be enhanced through more educated understanding of the kinds of problems faced by patients, the kinds of differing interests they would have. More education in these realms might more easily than in many fine medical schools become part of the training because of the deep scholarly resources that are so immediately available on our cohesive campus such as law, the social sciences, liberal arts, and public policy. Dr. Siegler, the very model of the kind of practitioner the Institute would aspire to develop, thrilled us with his agreement to spend a portion of his time as the first and founding director of the Institute. And those of you here who have the good good fortune to be his patients will be pleased, maybe relieved, to know that he will be continuing his patient practice. <laughs> After enough student scholars and mentors have been a part of the Institute, say in three years, convocations of participants will begin so that their experiences in the program will benefit many others. As we have seen the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics under Dr. Siegler achieve in the relatively few years since its inception in 1984, vast influence in hospitals and universities, even in whole societies. We know that Mark Siegler has the know-how to make this program effective. We see a strong need at this time for more primary care doctors, for doctors who know their patients as people, not just cases or diseases. We anticipate that this need will, need, will increase in coming years. With this well thought out program and with the strong resources and leadership available at the University of Chicago, 
We believe that this institute will be a national leader in addressing this need and in eventually proliferating throughout the country shining examples of doctors who by enhancing the lives of their patients are enriching their own and societies as well. Thank you very much, Kay, and um, you can see what a pleasure I had uh, interacting uh, with Mark and Kay on some of the administrative aspects of this program to try and bring it to reality. When I first arrived here in October and was told about the program, uh, it really touched a chord to me personally. Uh, you probably know that I trained uh, in South Africa as a physician. And in South Africa at the time, in the late 60s and the early 70s, obviously the uh, technology, even in the United States, uh, then was not what it is today, but certainly in South Africa, a developing country, um, what you really had to fall back on was uh, bedside skills, your interaction with a patient, the ability uh, to take a good history, the ability to follow up uh, on uh, problems that they told you about. Uh, and we were always taught that 90% of the uh, diagnosis in medicine uh, was based on what the patient told you. Um, now, obviously, with a lot of uh, compelling technologies that have been developed, I think that um, there are uh, tendencies on the part of physicians to rely more on the technologies uh, than on what patients tell them, on their interactions with patients and what they learn at the bedside. Uh, and so when Mark and after I had an opportunity to meet with Kay, when they told me about the vision of the program, uh, I thought that this was just a fantastic idea. Uh, and I really commend uh, Kay, um, who I think had a lot of the conception, as she said, but clearly I think she was inspired by what she saw in Mark, uh, and he obviously had a lot of uh, excellent ideas as well. So I believe that what we uh, are going to establish today at the University of Chicago is going to be a really special program that will get back to the roots of what is the essence of uh, the relationship between a doctor and his or her patients uh, to establish a relationship that is going to uh, promote uh, outstanding health care. And I think the way it's been constructed, as you know, um, the, uh, the, the focus of the program is at three different levels in physicians' careers. Uh, medical students and then junior faculty uh, and then senior faculty, so-called master clinicians. And what we envision is that the interaction uh, between young trainees and then people at the mid-level of their careers and then more senior people will lead to an interchange of ideas, a focus on the doctor-patient relationship. And I believe that this will uh, proliferate uh, the impact of the program uh, that it will ultimately be felt not just at the University of Chicago but very broadly. So I really want to thank uh, both Kay, uh, the rest of the Buxbaum family who were extraordinarily supportive and obviously, Mark, for coming up with this vision and for giving us the opportunity uh, to do something very special and exciting. So maybe, Mark, you could stand up and uh, let us acknowledge you as well, and let's give Mark a round of applause. Um, Mark. Mark, is, uh, as many of you know, is the Lindy uh, Bergman Distinguished uh, Professor of Medicine in the Department of Medicine. He directs the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics and is a superb physician. Uh, we're also very fortunate to have Matt Sorrentino here. Uh, so Matt is going to be uh, the initial Associate Director of the Institute. Matt, why don't you stand up? Um, <laughs> So for those of you who don't know Matt, he's an outstanding clinical cardiologist. I think he epitomizes and embodies all of the values uh, that we wish to capture in the Buxbaum Institute for Clinical Excellence. And I know that he and Mark and Kay will work together extraordinarily well, and uh, you know, we'll certainly uh, do everything we can to facilitate this. Uh, we're also very fortunate to have uh, three Buxbaum scholars here. Uh, so these are medical students who have been very carefully selected. Um, and uh, I'll ask them to stand. So Lisa Pruitt. So um, these are all. Uh, 
second year medical students. Uh, the second is uh, Alexander Ruby. And then, and Jasmine Taylor. So congratulations to all three of you. Uh, I think you all know that we have absolutely extraordinary medical students at the University of Chicago. So for the three of them to be, have been selected for this uh, honor is really a significant accomplishment. Um, so now we are going to have a very uh, exciting panel and it's going to be um, led by Eric Whitaker. Uh, so let me ask Eric to come up. Eric is the Executive Vice President for Strategic Affiliations and the Associate Dean for community-based research. He also held, uh, heads the Urban Health Initiative, and uh, Eric has really devoted his career to uh, facilitating healthcare delivery to underserved populations, to people who are less fortunate than ourselves, and I think it gets to the heart of one of the things that uh, Kay mentioned that is going to be central to the Buxbaum Institute. So thank you, Eric. Uh, good morning, and I want to join President Zimmer as well as Dean Polanski in, in thanking Kay and her family for, for their generous gift. Uh, on a personal note, Kay and I serve on the board of Grinnell College, and her family has been great supporters of education, particularly impactful education, and, and this gift is no different. So, Kay, uh, thank you for that. And I, I do want to tell you I'm headed to our board meeting soon this evening, so uh, we, we will uh, bear, bear the torch while, while you're here. Um, so, you know, I want to, uh, again, thank and congratulate uh, Dr. Mark Siegler for being the founding executive director, as well as the very deserving Buxbaum scholars. If I could have the panelists uh, please come forward and I'll start to introduce them. Uh, interestingly, all of them are, are graduates of the Pritzker School of Medicine, or will be, uh, as in the case of uh, Becky uh, Levine. Uh, and, and I have to say that, uh, you know, I was just talking to Kay as we were talking before we began, and I'm an internist, and, and the fact that I'm an internist is no, in no small part due to two of the panelists today because they were excellent role models, uh, and, and that, uh, you know, is, is very exciting. I do want to apologize if, uh, because if I were to begin enumerating the accomplishments and accolades of this, this crew, we wouldn't have time for a panel. So, you know, let's get started. Mark Siegler is uh, a graduate uh, in, from the class of 1967. Uh, as uh, Dr. Polanski mentioned, he's a Lindy Bergman Distinguished Service Professor of Medicine and the director of the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics and will be the first executive director of the Buxbaum Institute. Uh, importantly, Mark was the first attending I met on the wards as I became a third year student and, uh, and I, get, I was able to see Mark at the bedside and only hope that some of what he had rubbed off on me uh, as I became a, 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 a physician. Uh, second, we have uh, Dr. Holly Humphrey, who's an honors graduate from the class of 1983. She's a professor of medicine and dean for medical education at the University of Chicago. Uh, she's what we would officially call a lifer. Uh, she completed her internal medicine residency graduate, her, her training here, as well as her pulmonary and critical care fellowship uh, before joining the faculty in, in 1989. Uh, she served as the, the head of the internal medicine residency program for 14 years and really was an, a national leader for not only our internal medicine residency program but across the country. Uh, and be, before she moved to her current position as Dean for Medical Education in 2003. She's a nationally recognized expert in medical education scholarship, and, and I have to say a leading light for medical students and residents is uh, they try and find their way in this thing we call medicine and their career tracks. And lastly, uh, you know, really getting to the point that Kay mentioned earlier, uh, you talked about idealism and altruism. Uh, Becky Levine uh, embodies that uh, in, in spades. Uh, she's a graduate of the laboratory school uh, class of, uh, is it 2003? Yeah. Jeez Louise. <laughs> <laughs> um, as I look at that number, you know, it, uh, she, she's a fourth year student at the Pritzker School of Medicine. And I say geez Louise because she's been active from the moment she stepped on this campus, having co-founded the Pritzker Mammography Access Partnership and the Students for the Advancement of Medical Spanish. That was in our first two years. And she then went on to co-direct the Adolescent Substance Abuse Prevention Program 
And as they say, on, uh, it used to be on Channel 9, and there's more. Uh, as a fourth year student, she uh, co-directs the Pritzker Community Service Fellowship, uh, an organization that promotes the development of leaders in public service and community health. And so I, you know, I've had the fine pleasure of meeting Becky through her participation in the community health scholarship track of the Pritzker Initiative. So she's come to Pritzker, has been a leader, and we expect to see her leading in the future. So welcome, everyone. Um, we, we will consider the overall topic of strengthening the doctor-patient relationship to enhance patient outcomes. And I want to start out with a round-robin question, so uh, please get ready for that. Uh, the, the question, uh, and I want to direct this to uh, Dr. Siegler. Uh, who were the most important mentors, and what were some key moments at which the importance of the doctor-patient relationship became clear to you? I haven't said this for a while, but um, but in the old days, in the old days, um, medical school interviews interviewers used to come to the college campus rather than the way we do it these days. I'm sure. Becky did it, uh, where, where the student comes to the university. And Chicago sent out uh, two uh, extraordinary people uh, to, to visit the, the campuses. Uh, one was a clinician named Bob Page, um, uh, and the other was the great um, rheumatology scholar uh, who's, who's been at the, the Rockefeller for a long time. I'll, I'll remember his name in a moment. And, and they tag-teamed the interview. And the idea of the interview was uh, that OCAP, yeah, Atella Kappas, who was, was the great scientist. And the idea of the interview at, the, at our college was that at Chicago, you, you came to combine the science and the art of medicine. Bob Page was a great clinical cardiologist, and, and Cap was the great uh, uh, laboratory scientist. And that message was not only powerful in my coming to Chicago, I had never previously crossed the Alleghenies, uh, so th this really was an adventure, but it was true. <laughs> I mean, everything that I experienced in, in the 45 or 50 years that I've been at Chicago, it's been 48, I think, uh, has, has brought to light that, that original observation that Chicago allows you to combine th these, these two, two areas. Uh, I mean, the scientific, the scientific people that I studied with, beginning with Leon Jacobson and, uh, and Janet Rowley, Jean Goldwasser, who died this past year, uh, Don Steiner, uh, were extraordinary people. And, and the clinicians that I learned from, uh, beginning first and foremost with Dr. Kersner, who has joined us today. Dr. Kersner had his 102nd birthday yesterday. <laughs> I mean, Joe and I spent a lot of time on the wards when I was a med student, an intern, a resident. Uh, uh, I've been a long time. And, and Joe, Joe told us that everything was important, science and, and clinical inquiry, but patients came first. Patients were the absolute first priority. And, and that message was carried on by people like uh, Lou Cohen and Al Tarloff and Arthur Rubenstein, uh, the late George Block and John Altman. Uh, these were all of them great models for us. And, and the way you learn medicine, the way we hope to teach the next generation is by seeing, not by talking. So you got, you got to demonstrate, you have to show what good care is about. And, and, and I, learned, I learned what good care was about studying with people like Joe and the others I mentioned. So I, I hope that touched on your question. Yes. Uh, how, Holly, how about your mentors and uh, the importance of the doctor-patient relationship? Yes, Eric, you introduced me as a lifer at the University of <laughs> Chicago, and there's actually one reason for that. Yeah. And the reason um, you would introduce me that way is because not only was my career born here, but it was inspired 
by those who were my mentors. And so as a medical student, I could name basically the faculty in the biological sciences division, but I'll not do that today. <laughs> and instead tell you that as my career continued here, not only were the faculty in the biological sciences division my mentors, but a few people did come to stand out. And the thing that um, inspires me as I sit here this morning is that some of those individuals are actually in this room, and they include Dr. Joe Kersner, with whom I rotated as a third-year medical student and again as a second-year resident. And today, when I'm talking with my colleagues around the country, not only do they think of Dr. Kersner for his excellence in patient care, but every person tells me about Dr. Kersner's relationship with referring physicians and how he ended every day by picking up the phone and calling all the referring physicians whose patients he had cared for that day. The man to my left taught me the basic skills in physical diagnosis. And then when I became a fourth year medical student, I helped him teach another group of medical students uh, physical diagnosis. But the most important thing about the person to my left is he was the attending physician for my husband when my husband was a third month intern. And my husband to this day as an interventional cardiologist refers to Dr. Mark Siegler as the attending with whom he had the most fun taking care of patients. Mm -hmm. Certainly the individual who had the most profound influence on my career trajectory and on um, the inspiration for my career is Dr. Arthur Rubenstein and all of the faculty in the section of pulmonary and critical care medicine, Dr. Larry Wood, Jesse Hall, Gene Geppard, I could go on and on and on. But what we know from the science of mentorship is that when we are trying to pass on the values of a profession, the values are best passed on through the lineage of mentorship. And so it's inspiring for me to see that being played out right here this morning. Well, you, you just gave a, a hall of fame of great teachers as you went down <laughs> the did. line. So I, I, and I, I hadn't thought of a lot of those, those individuals in a long time. Uh, Becky? Oh, yeah. Um, so first, I'd also like to thank uh, Mr. and Mrs. Buxbaum for their incredibly generous and important gift. Uh, in terms of the mentors who've had the greatest impact on me, um, I have two, I have many, many mentors uh, at Pritzker. I'm, I feel very honored to be a medical student here. Uh, but two people who really stand out in my mind are Dr. Shalini Reddy and Dr. Peter Angelos. Uh, I had the opportunity to, to work with Dr. Shalini Reddy during my internal medicine rotation. Uh, and during this time, we had a lot of very tough cases. Um, some patients were getting their first uh, diagnoses of terminal illnesses, and uh, Dr. Reddy um, made sure to spend extra time with these patients to make sure that all of their answers or all their questions were answered uh, and all their concerns were addressed. Um, and just sitting with her during these beautiful conversations with the patients and their families was incredibly inspiring. Uh, and now I feel much more prepared to have these sorts of conversations with my patients and to make sure that they have um, meaningful end-of-life care. Uh, in addition, uh, Dr. Peter Angelos was also incredibly inspiring to me. Uh, he's uh, a wonderful endocrine surgeon here, and he makes sure to um, talk to all of his patients and make sure that they understand um, their, their surgical procedures and make sure that all their uh, questions are answered. So I was very inspired how he really emphasizes patient education and um, informed decisions um, and make sure that his patients are part of the decision-making process. Uh, so I'll make sure to keep that in mind as well as I go on in my career to inform my patients about their illnesses and their treatment options. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, th this is a question for Mark. Uh, you know, the University of Chicago is a data-driven place. Uh, as, as you consider the doctor-patient relationship, what does the data tell us? We, we need more. We, we need more data on this. But um, s some of the things that, that we've learned in the last 20 years um, is that good doctor-patient relationships translate um, into improved patient outcomes. In, in, a, in a wide variety of ways. Um, a, a good relationship inspires uh, confidence, increases trust, uh, improves satisfaction on the part of the patient. 
uh, it's been shown uh, to lead to much more reasonable and efficient uh, decisions and choices with regard to allocation of resources, both in general and uh, in particular, Becky, in terms of end of life uh, care. Um, but in addition to that, th there's some hard outcome data on, on conditions like high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, osteoarthritis, uh, peptic ulcer disease, uh, depression, that the relationship itself improves outcomes. Uh, th that's something that, that you can't measure in economic terms so easily, but it's been demonstrated. And, and so, so relationships are, are really vitally important in, in both the satisfaction of the doctor and the satisfaction of the patient and, and in the outcome for the patient. Um, Holly, uh, why, why is the, the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine and, and the, the Medical Center a great place for this sort of effort for the Buxbaum Institute? Well, I too want to thank the Buxbaums uh, for this incredibly generous gift, and I think the University of Chicago is exactly the right place um, for the gift for a number of reasons, the most important of which is the fact that we are the teacher of teachers, and that is evidenced not only because we like to think of ourselves that way, but the data supports uh, the fact that of all the medical schools in this country, this particular medical school tends to have graduates populate faculties of schools of medicine across this country at a higher rate than typically the case. So. Several years ago, the data showed that Harvard Medical School produced 26% of its graduates in faculties of medicine 10 years after graduation. I don't know what Harvard's number is today, but I can tell you that today, the most recent data for the University of Chicago's Pritzker School of Medicine is 30% of our graduates are populating the faculties of medicine at schools across the country. So this gift, allows our medical school to make a very public statement to our students at the time they're applying to medical school and then during their experience in medical school that the doctor-patient relationship is fundamentally important in the education of a physician. And then upon graduation, our students populate schools across the country and carry on that Buxbaum tradition wherever they go. Um, Becky, uh, it, it's been said, and I don't know if it's true, but it's been said <coughs> that the, the education process for physicians can beat the humanity <laughs> out of, out of uh, its trainees. Uh, as you consider that, uh, how do you think this institute, as, as you look in your crystal ball, how do you think this institute could help uh, improve the situation for the outcomes of clinical training? Uh, that's a great question. I think that the Institute is really important and it can help um, students and physicians um, avoid burnout and stay um, committed to the primary reasons they went into medicine um, to help heal patients um, and care fully for them um, by uh, giving them a toolkit of various methods and ways of um, caring compassionately for their patients. Uh, patients respond to many different types of um, communication. Um, some respond to um, compassion and empathy. Others respond to providing um, educational materials uh, to them to give them important information about their illnesses. Uh, and others respond to um, poetry. Um, I actually found this uh, during my third year clinical rotations. I had a patient um, with prostate cancer that had spread to his bones, and he was in significant pain, uh, and we had you know, given him many medications, but he was still experiencing a lot of pain. Uh, so I decided to read him some poems to try to help alleviate his suffering. Uh, and one afternoon after reading him a poem, uh, he told me, I reread your poems in the evenings, and I wake up in the mornings with positive thoughts. I was really moved by this statement, and um, I was surprised by the healing power of poetry. Uh, and I found that after he told me this, he uh, also started asking me more of his medical questions and taking a more active role in his uh, treatment plans. Um, and I think this is because he trusted me more and he felt very comfortable. 
Um, so as a result of this experience, uh, classmate Maggie Nolan and I are uh, developing a poetry anthology for uh, medical students to carry in their white coat pockets mm. and uh, to read to their patients. Uh, and we hope that they can use this as a tool um, to promote stronger doctor-patient communication. Uh, so I think the Buxbaum Institute will help um, inspire kind of innovative methods through research, through discussion, through mentoring um, to uh, continue these sorts of efforts to provide very patient-centered and compassionate care. Uh, Mark, why is establishing a compassionate and caring doctor-patient relationship challenging yet essential in the current environment of technological advances and changing healthcare economics? For all the reasons that you said <laughs> in your question. Uh, okay, let's uh, go to a different question. I, I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> so, so. I, I, I mean, they, there are great pressures, uh, real pressures, on um, uh, economic pressures, uh, political, social pressures, uh, to um, that 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 make that make the establishment and and maintenance of those relationships difficult. Um, may, maybe time and communication are, are the real essentials in, in being able to, um, uh, to to organize and and conduct good doctor-patient relationships. And and the modern pressures move against that in many ways. Um, some people some people I think falsely uh, or mistakenly. Uh, contrast the science of medicine with the art of medicine, as if those two were in tension. Uh, I, I, think, I think that's a, an inappropriate dichotomy. Uh, I mean, I think the goal is to take these extraordinary scientific and technical advances of the last 30, 40, 50 years and be able to apply them in face-to-face -face encounters with patients in a concerned, compassionate, empathic way. Um, nobody, nobody would want to go back to periods when there was, Bob Zimmer and I were talking before we started, when there was no penicillin to treat earaches. Um, I, I mean, that, that, that's not anything that anybody would want. The advances in antibiotics and blood pressure medicine and cancer medicines and surgical techniques are extraordinary. And we want to save those and, and continue those advances while applying them in more effective doctor-patient relationships. So it's gonna take work, Eric. It's gonna take work under the real pressures of the current situation. But I think this institute can begin to redress, perhaps, the, the imbalances that have grown in the system uh, over the last 40, 50 or years or longer, and, and, and begin the process of including the doctor-patient relationship, including communication and decision-making as a, a vitally important part of, of good medical practice to apply those new scientific advances. Um, Holly, you know, the Buxbaum Institute will sit uh, within the Pritzker School of Medicine here uh, working along with our medical center. Why is it important that that's cited at a university, like the University of Chicago? What, what benefit is it for having an institute based here? Well, I think there are lots of benefits for having the institute based here. In addition to what I already mentioned related to the University of Chicago's medical school having a focus on developing future faculties around the country, this medical school has a very long history that continues today to be unique in the interdisciplinary nature of our curriculum. And in fact, when I speak with medical school alumni from recent decades as well as those from many decades ago, the most frequent thing they talk about is their education in terms of the interdisciplinary opportunities, the fact that they could take courses in other divisions on this campus. They think of the school as a school that's at the center of a very big world-class university, and it's a university that they took full advantage of during their time here as students, and it stays with them after they have left, and it sticks with them 
for generations. So I think this institute that's focusing on the humanness of the doctor-patient relationship, that's focusing on the fact that ultimately there are limits in technology and limits in science, but there should never be limits in compassion and kindness and in health care for all individuals, irrespective of their socioeconomic conditions or backgrounds in terms of uh, the walks of life in which they've lived. Um, Becky, it, it would be fair to say I was wild by the experience you've had in leadership and service since you've been here the last uh, four years. Could you speak a little bit about community and uh, as you ponder the, the Bucksbaum Institute and the sort of uh, values and experiences that, that should play into the scholars as they, they go forward in their own careers? Yeah. Uh, so I'm uh, applying into family medicine now, and I'm very committed to working with underserved populations. And I think it's really essential um, to develop strong doctor-patient communication skills when working in the community with underserved populations. This is because um, underserved populations um, have many barriers to um, receiving quality health care. Some of these barriers include uh, language barriers, cultural barriers, and educational barriers. Uh, so when working um, with my patients, uh, it's very important to address all of these barriers. And an institute like the Bucksbaum Institute will teach us um, the important skills to best provide care um, for underserved populations and address these uh, disparities. And we're, we're closing in on uh, our, our time, but I wanted to ask this, this question uh, of, of Mark uh, first. And, and that is, I lost my question, where'd it go? <laughs> um, oh, I, I guess bringing us back to the, the title of the, 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 the program today, Strengthen the Doctor-Patient Relationship to Enhance Patient Outcomes. How will the formal study of the doctor-patient relationship actually get us to those patient outcomes that we seek? Um, and how, how will this institute get us there? Well, I, I think one of the goals of the institute um, is, to, um, is to do the, the kind of translational research and outcomes research um, that I mentioned earlier uh, we need to demonstrate the importance um, and effectiveness of, of good doctor-patient relationships. Um, th th that those would be studies in, in such areas as, as doctor-patient communication, um, studies in, in areas such as decision-making, and then studies uh, in, in light of that data that I was saying earlier about uh, outcome data uh, for certain conditions and disease states in which medicine and, and scientific interventions play a role, but in which um, the personal interactions also serve as an important component of caring. Um, I mean, I, I, I think that, that this, this encounter, Eric, you know, this doctor-patient thing is as ancient as medicine itself. I mean, I mean it goes back to the Greeks, to the Egyptians, and I don't know how far beyond that. Um, there's always somebody who's sick in any society who comes asking for help. And there's some sort of healer in the society, um, in, our, in our case it's often a physician, who is prepared to meet the request for help. And then the thing gets transacted, worked out, in this individual encounter, the two of them. So the greatest scientific advances, I think Becky and Holly's comments re reflect this, get translated into delivery at the one-on-one -on -one level. Sometimes we use teams now in the hospital because things uh, uh, require teamwork, but, but there's a human encounter to deliver the scientific advance. And I think all of that is susceptible to study, amenable to study, um, and I think that's one of our goals <clears throat> at the Bucksbaum Institute. If this is my last question, I too want to very much thank Kay and Matthew for their extraordinary uh, 
pledge to the Institute. Uh, it means so much, as you know, to me and, and, and to all of us at the university. I want to thank John and Jackie and, and Anne and Tom, who aren't here today. Um, and, and I saw Marshall over there, Marshall Eisenberg, for all of his uh, help working with all of us on, on, on this wonderful gift. Uh, it, it, it really is a transformative type of, of gift. And, um, and, and I, this is something that I hadn't told Kay. But I, I went back in my correspondence and I found a letter that I had written to Matthew in 1992. 1992. Uh, or would, it, would it have been, maybe it was 2002, but it was a long, 2002. 2002. 2002, in which, in which the, the, um, the origins of this institute, I, I mean, in, in sort of a very early form, uh, was sketched out in, based on conversations and discussions. I will find that letter and, and give it to you because I, I had lost, I, I had not remembered it either. But I do want to again express my deep thanks uh, for your confidence in the university, in the medical center, in the medical school, um, in, in giving us this wonderful gift. Uh, Holly, you're the dean of medical education. Uh, how, how does the Buxbaum Institute fit in with the work that, that's already being done here at the University of Chicago and the Pritzker School of Medicine? I think this gift uh, fits in in a number of ways. First of all, it makes a statement to the 7,000 applicants to our medical school about the core values of this school. And then it makes a statement to those who choose to enroll here that their curriculum will be rich and wonderful in a whole variety of ways, and there will be a depth to the curriculum in the doctor-patient relationship, and that that will serve as a very important foundation as they build their career, careers for a lifetime. And, and Becky, you get the final question. <laughs> uh, and, and, I, and you may have already answered this question, uh, and the choice of mentors you have. And, uh, you know, as, as we think about the principles and the values that the Buxbaum Institute will advance, is this something only for primary care doctors? Um, or, you know, is, is, should it be for all doctors? Yeah, I, I definitely think that this should be for all doctors. I think um, it's definitely essential for primary care doctors who see patients every day and are in charge of coordinating all of their care. In addition, I think it's very important for specialists. Um, as we mentioned before, in this increasingly technological world, um, we have many um, diagnostic and therapeutic tools that are very advanced, but that doesn't mean we can lose sight of uh, um, the most important aspect of medicine, which is our patients, and remembering the humanism behind medicine and taking really high quality care of them. And as specialists, um, it's really important to not only focus on the very um, specific part of the body of the patient, but also the patient as a person. Um, because if patients are comfortable and trust their doctors, they're more likely to ask their medical questions and to uh, follow treatment recommendations. So I think it's important for both uh, primary care doctors and specialists. Um, I, I would like to ask you to help applaud our panel. <laughs> I'd have to say, having uh, spent six years of my life training here at the University of Chicago, that the bar for clinical excellence is already pretty high <laughs> in terms of education. And with the Buxbaum Institute, it'll be even higher. So you know, I, again, want to thank Kay for the gift and invite Dean Polanski up to uh, con conclude our program. Thank you, Eric. Um, and thank you to the panelists. Uh, I hope that. Uh, Kay and uh, John and Jackie have uh, been reinforced by the wisdom of their decision to place this at the University of Chicago. I think that it's clear that this is going to be a transformative program and uh, I would just like to thank them once again and we look forward to making this a reality and to making it very, very special. So thank you all for coming. There is an, uh, a reception in the lobby uh, immediately following, so uh, thank you and we'll see you over some food and something to drink. Thank you for being here.